Coming second to Eric Dollard is uh, very difficult, I assure you, because he can go on like this for probably about five hours, and we'll have you convinced at the end of the fifth hour. But uh, I'd like to demonstrate something uh, for you people that are not familiar with a longitudinal wave. Uh, I'm going to let uh, Eric hold one in. Let's start off with the transverse wave. Now, as we hold this hose here, sideways flow. You can see that it takes a finite time for this transverse wave to propagate from one end of this hose to the other. You can see there's a finite time. That finite time is the speed of light. And that is what we're considering our limit in the uh, electromagnetic world in classical theory. Okay, now Eric and I are going to demonstrate the longitudinal wave, the one that travels infinitely faster than the speed of light and uh, has no losses. <laughs> just, just jerk it like I said. As you can see, there's, it's, if you move one end, the other end moves instantaneously. There is no time delay as there is with the transverse wave. And it's very important to pay attention to that because that's the one we completely ignore. That is the pressure wave essentially through the ether, as it was, uh, can, one way to describe it. But uh, you should remember that little demonstration because we spend all our time looking at just one of two waves. The uh, transverse wave is unfortunately the one with the losses. The, uh, the longitudinal wave is the one with no losses that we don't even acknowledge exists. And that's also the one I might add how our minds transmit between each other. And that's the one that cells use to communicate with each other. It's the one that nerves use to communicate with each other. I have a more uh, interesting uh, chart. I'll use Eric's chart here. As you can see, if you were to stack these cells up here side by side of uh, number three, two here. The, this is the, uh, the transmission line with the capacitors in series and the coils in shunt. If you put another one here and another one and another one, what you find is you have four capacitors in a little cell-like structure. You have four capacitors, a coil shunt, four capacitors, a coil shunt, four capacitors, a coil shunt. It's my theory that the capacitors are the cell membrane of the cells next to each other and the coil is probably DNA, would be my guess. And it is a guess, of course, but I've done a lot of, I have a feeling that's how uh, the nerve fibers work and also probably how life itself develops energy from the ether and scalar fields. Of course, the concept of the ether was banned, when was it, there? Uh, 19... Einstein. Yeah, Einstein, yeah, basically. Einstein knew how it all worked, but he did not... Uh, uh, was not allowed, shall we say, to divulge it. All right, I have a little lecture on two devices uh, that I found quite interesting, seeing as how nobody really understands how these things work. Everybody thinks they know how a transformer works. We're going to go over that one. <laughs> and we're also going to go over this interesting device here, which I've been passing around for the last 15 minutes ball bearing motor. Now you can win a lot of bar bets with this one and uh, a lot of people would lose it hands down but all we do here is we take two ball bearings of any kind you want connect them in this kind of fashion with an ammeter connect to the outer race of each ball bearing Use a conductive shaft of some kind, makes no difference. I use brass, you can use steel, you can use anything you want. And get a four to six volt battery and just connect them to this thing and you'd never think it would run, but it does. Eric, I need you to get this started. You have to give it a uh, zero starting torque. You have to give it a spin. Stand out of the way of the thing. You have to give it a spin because its starting torque is very low. But its running torque is very high. There we 
variable state of bias. So run both directions, one polarity. So, so you can win a few bar bets with that one more, let me tell you. And if anybody wants, I've tried it with about five different types of bearings, they all work just fine. And it uh, doesn't seem to be fussy. You've got to get at least 10 to about 50 amps going through the bearings before it works properly. But Eric and I have both thrashed this one around for quite a while. And uh, I, I agree with Eric. It, it proves that we've got two vortexes operating here in the current somehow through the ball bearings. And the, the vortexes themselves are making the balls rotate. And uh, that's another theory in itself because the energy does vortex in and vortex out in the ether. All right, now we'll get into something a little more interesting. Does everybody know what a transformer is? <clears throat> They're on every power pole in every city, in every residential area, in every industrial building. I work out of UCSB and I deal with them every day. We've got probably about 400 of them out there, large ones. And they seldom cause any trouble. And, uh, but unfortunately, nobody really quite understands how they work. And you say, oh, I know how a transformer works. You know, I learned it in electronics class and all that. And uh, that's true, you did. But uh, we're going to go through a little basic principles of electronics here and power generation, right, just for a second. If I take a magnet, bar magnet right here, and a piece of steel, and hold the steel up next to the bar magnet, what happens is, in classical thinking, <clears throat> the magnetic flux lines of the magnetic field are attracted to this piece of iron. The iron tries to close the field lines, and you get a concentration of field lines in the iron itself. Iron is like a sponge. It just kind of grabs all the flux lines up. And uh, the other principle we are on in electronics is that if we take a bar magnet and cause it to move around a conductor with a meter on it, the moving magnetic lines of force cutting the wire field generates a current that you can read with a meter. And everybody has demonstrated that at some time or another, I'm sure that's not anything. Uh, but the, the, the principle is the field lines cut the wires and the wires somehow generate electricity, interesting theory. Uh, on the primary winding of a transformer, this is a toroid. This is a, hopefully a perfect transformer. It has no core losses, and we'll just assume it has very good high permeability core. If you put an AC signal generator on this thing and your typical primary winding, the primary side we understand quite well because when the current flows through the winding, the, the flux line, it tries to make a bar magnet basically out of this piece of core right here because you have turns around it and you have a piece of steel in it. So what happens is all the flux lines, just like this uh, piece of iron up here, jump from the winding into the core itself, the magnetic core, and it forms a magnetic loop, uh, actually a magnetic flux path around the transformer. And since it's AC in here, the flux, the magnetic field is changing both direction and magnitude with the alternating source. Is everybody following me so far? And nobody's disagreeing with anything. Okay, no that's way. Are you? No way. You're not following. Well, you don't have to follow. That's all right. Snake oil. All right. Yeah, snake oil. You can explain this when I get through. Anyway, uh, the problem exists in the secondary coil which we all assume when the magnetic flux lines supposedly cross the winding of the secondary coil, it generates current, producing current in this arbitrary resistive load. The problem is that iron sucks up most all of the magnetic field, like 98 percent